Thank you very much indeed. Welcome to Hall D for this plenary session on forests for a healthy, prosperous and peaceful world. I'm your moderator, Henry Bonsu. I'm from the UK and Ghana and delighted to be in the Republic of Korea for the third time, enjoying your wonderful hospitality, uh, the wonderful area of Samdong and also Ganyam. I haven't seen Tsai yet, but I'm hoping to see him. <laughs> hoping to see him. But what is great is that you are really committed as a government and as a country to sustainability, uh, to combating climate change, and to this um, very, very serious issue of forestry. One of the things I've noticed about this Congress so far is that we've looked at various different sectors. We've looked at women and their role in uh, forestry. We've looked at nature-based solutions. We've looked at decent employment. The question is, how do we bring these themes and more together? How do we convince the people not here that forests really do contribute to a healthy, prosperous and peaceful world? Well, that's the reason why this session is so important. So I want to welcome everybody here in this room in Hall D. We want to welcome those people tuning in online around the world. And those of you who really need to engage with this subject, we're going to hear from three keynote speakers, two in the room and one online, and four panelists, three in the room and one online. And we'll get most of them together after they've had their initial opening remarks up on the stage here, and we'll have an interactive dialogue, and we hope to receive some questions from you. So let's get started. Our first keynote speaker is the Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, one of the organizations that convened this wonderful uh, Congress. Her name is Madame Maria Helena Semedo, who is a Deputy Director General of FAO. She's an economist and politician from Cabo Verde, a leading expert in global development issues and has worked in public service for over 30 years. And Madame Semedo is going to set the scene and explain to us just why promoting cross-sectoral collaboration is so important and why it's so crucial to strengthen the forestry sector's linkages with food security, nutrition, health, and peace building. Why forestry is not something over here, but it's at the center, and why it's important for every aspect of human life. So please give her a round of applause, the Deputy Director General of FAO, Madame Maria Helena Semedo. Thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Excellency, Minister Byung Choi, Minister of the Korea Forest Service, Excellencies, fellow panelists, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be here to discuss how we can promote the role of forests for healthy, prosperous, and a peaceful world. We know the world faces huge and interconnected challenge. The social and economic consequences of the climate crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as increasing conflicts. Environment deterioration is contributing to climate change, biodiversity loss, and potential new diseases. Today, more than 3 billion rural people are affected by land degradation. Forests, providing multiple goods and services, can play a critical role in healing and helping humanity recover from this crisis and build back better to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2022 flagship report on the state of the world forest, which we launched here yesterday, demonstrated that we can have healthy economies if we have healthy ecosystems 
as it has been said, they are completely interlinked, and that forests and trees can play a crucial role if well managed and sustainably used. Benefits from forests are huge, hanging from wood and non-wood forest products, fresh air and recreation, to food, medicine, energy and jobs. Moreover, when you look at our cities, forests and other green spaces contribute to improving human well-being. More people live in urban areas than ever before. By 2050, 68% of the world's population will be living in cities. The COVID-19 pandemic and related restriction measures demonstrated the importance of urban and peri-urban peri areas and forests. Lockdowns around the world affected not only the physical, but also mental health of people, where nature helped people cope with these impacts. Urban forests and other green areas help mitigate many of the drawbacks of living in urban areas. They buffer noise, reduce the urban heat, and provide green spaces for exercise, recreation, and areas to distress. On the urban front, 2020, FAO launched the Green Cities Initiatives, looking to improve city living by promoting a healthy environment and healthy diets from sustainable agri-food system increasing availability of green spaces through urban and peri-urban forestry, while also contributing to climate change mitigation and adaptation and sustainable resource management. And we aim to achieve 1,000 green cities by 2030 and 100 by end of 2022. Forests and trees are also vital safety nets during disaster and crisis, including violent conflicts. They can meet immediate needs in times of emergency, as well as provide long-term li livelihoods opportunities. Acknowledge the importance of the environment and ecosystem with animal, plant, and human health livelihoods and sustainable management of natural, resor natural resources, wildlife and forests, FAO promotes a One Health approach in partnership with the World Health Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health and the United Nations Environment Program, or what we call the quadripartite to promote global health of people livestock, wildlife, plants, and the environment. And we know more than ever after the COVID-19 pandemic that we cannot dissociate the health of animal, plants, and humans with the environment. They are interconnected. With conflict, a main driver of food crisis around the world, FAO promotes partnership to support peace. In this regard, FAO works actively to mainstream conflict-sensitive strategies in the areas of food security, resilience, and emergency response. We contribute to identify opportunities that contribute to sustain peace, for example, by strengthening local conflict management capacities over natural resources. And we know more and more we have the displaced by the conflicts around natural resources. The combined impact of COVID-19, the climate crisis and conflicts call for urgent, concerted and ambitious action. Working in partnership and across sectors is key and the protection, sustainable management and sustainable use of forests 
is an essential part of the equation if you want a healthy, prosperous, and peaceful world. Today's discussion is very timely and provides us with an opportunity to exchange experience and perspective from different countries for strengthening connection between forests, peace, and well-being. I look forward to the out outcome of this plenary session to bring to the attention and further discussion at upcoming FAO Committee on Forests, COFO 26, and the World Forest Week next October. We consider this session so important that we need to take it outside the 15 World Forest Congress. I wish you a successful event, and I thank you for your attention. Over to you, moderator. You don't have to be so polite in your applause. You can applause with real enthusiasm. <laughs> That's what I like to see. <laughs> because we're human beings and we're connected by forests and we're also connected by words and we're also connected by Hall D. Excellent, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Secretary General. And now let's move on to our minister. Minister, His Excellency, Byung Am Choi, Minister of Korea Forest Service. And in a previous session, Minister, I heard what you and your government are doing, this is from a senior civil servant, to create decent, secure employment in the forestry service and to create almost like a green city, which I'd never heard of before, which is uh, excellent. So we want to hear more, uh, Minister, from you. Um, a little bit of an introduction. His Excellency has three decades of experience in the Korea Forest Service, working toward conservation and restoration, and is now Minister. Previously, he was Deputy Minister of the KFS from 2021, so 2020 to 2021, and the Director General of the Planning and Coordination Bureau from 2018 to 2020. So he's been in this area for a long time. And Minister Byung Am Choi will address the interconnection of forests with the health sector, something that Madame uh, Semedo was talking about earlier, this one health approach, with, by highlighting the role of forests in human health and well-being, particularly for urban populations who think they have nothing to do with forests. I'm an urban person, but I now feel I'm connected to the forest, which is good, and industrialized societies, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the actions we need to build back better. Minister, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to see you all once again. I am Choi Byung Am, Minister of the Korea Forest Service. Uh, it is very meaningful that we're discussing in the second plenary session, Forests for a Healthier and Prosperous World. This is a very appropriate topic and it is indeed very meaningful. Today, in my keynote presentation, as was mentioned by the moderator, I'm going to be discussing how we can use forests to improve our urban environment and achieve carbon neutrality and create jobs at the same time. I'm going to share with you some recent policy cases of Korea. The COVID-19 pandemic has minimized movements across countries and limited our daily lives. And the whole world is facing cross-border challenges due to natural disasters and climate change. They do not respect national borders. According to an analysis on big data from a major domestic portal site from 2016 to 2021, they found that trending keywords were changed 
from cultural events and large-scale activities to enjoying nature, rest, and small-scale activities during the pandemic. It means that there was a reduction in social activities during the pandemic, and thus increasing people's attention to nature. As you may know, Korea has been working hard to restore the forests. But we still need to expand urban forests, which will help us relieve mental stress and deal with heat waves in cities and find us problems. In Korea, we have been experiencing rapid pop urbanization. In Korea, about 92% of the population live in cities. And we have a large forest cover across the nation, but when it comes to urban environments, the urban forest area per person is only 11.51 square meters, which exceeds the WHO's recommendation of 9 square meters per capita, but this is far below that of London and other major cities. Urban forests include roadside trees, green belts, school forests, and parks. These urban areas, urban green areas are um, serving as eco-friendly solutions to urban problems such as noise, fine dust, and low biodiversity. According to a research by the Korea Forestry Research Institute, urban forests help lower the daytime average temperature in cities by 3 to 7 degrees Celsius in the summer, and it helps increase humidity by 9 to 23 percent. So they are effective for microclimate regulation. In addition, when we plant tall trees alongside the roads, then we can reduce the noise from vehicles by 75% and the noise coming from trucks by 80%. One of the largest environmental issues in Northeast Asia is air pollution and fine dust and yellow dust. By utilizing urban forests, we can reduce the level of fine dust and ultra fine dust in the air by 26% and 40% respectively, according to a research. In addition, to resolving such problems as noise and air pollution, urban forests are useful and valuable for human health, mental health. In 2020, when we were going through the major pandemic waves, more than 2,500 people, including healthcare professionals and the vulnerable groups, participated in forest-related programs, and they were found to decrease depression and other negative emotions caused by the pandemic. We see that there's urban rapid urbanization, but building and expanding green infrastructure and urban forests are going to play an even more important role going forward. Therefore, the Korea Forest Service has plans to expand urban forests. In 2018, urban forests was about 4,800 hectares, but we expanded this to 5,446 hectares in 2020. In addition, we have been creating urban gardens. And by 2030, our goal is to increase the urban forest area to 10,551 hectares. We understand that urban forests help reduce temperatures and noise in the urban areas, as well as improving the air quality. And I hope that these solutions will help improve our quality of life. If we make a transition to green cities, Citizens will enjoy better 
quality of life, and these will also contribute to restoring the ecosystems. At the same time, forests have been recognized as very effective carbon sinks. At the Davos Forum in 2020, an initiative to, tra initiative to plant one trillion trees was announced, and the UN and other organizations are carrying out initiatives to plant one trillion trees by 2030. And the Korean government has created a public-private council to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, and our, one of our targets is to restore and protect forests so that we can create a circular economy. We're focusing on planting and preserving trees so that they can absorb carbon. One hectare of pine tree forest in Korea can absorb up to 10.8 tons of carbon a year. This is equivalent to carbon emitted by 4.5 cars per year. This means that forests are the ultimate and the optimal solutions to climate change. By 2050, Korea will make sure to utilize forests to absorb more than, two, more than 23 million tons. However, carbon neutrality cannot be achieved by any single country's effort. We need to work together. Governments in countries around the world need to join hands in achieving carbon neutrality. Let me now talk about creating jobs utilizing forests. The OECD announced that about 22 million jobs among the OECD member countries have been lost due to the pandemic. There was a fear of about infection and lockdowns and extreme uncertainties in the economies sharply decreased economic activities and therefore the unemployment rate among the OECD countries far exceeded an all-time high in 2009 when the global financial crisis took place. Even before the pandemic, Korea has been creating massive green jobs to surmount unemployment crisis. In, two, in 1997, Korea went through an, an, the Asia financial crisis, and in 2009, and there was the global financial crisis. In these periods, Korea was able to create one create 13,000 jobs per year, and we provided jobs to members of the vulnerable group so that they could maintain their livelihoods. Taking advantage of this experience, we established long-term employment policies and emergency measures, including projects for creating new jobs and compensate damages to overcome the national employment crisis driven by the pandemic. We also implemented emergency employment measures and emergency support measures by providing vouchers to forest foresters in trouble. Furthermore, we're providing education and training to the youth so that they can acquire technical field experiences and they can, they can also acquire certification in the forest sector. Through these efforts, we are planning to create 60,000 green new jobs this year and 80,000 jobs by 2025. We believe that forest has huge potential in employment and serves as driving force in the growing economy, combining with various sectors such as welfare and environment and education and culture, in addition to the traditional forestry industries. In 2021, The Guardian, a British newspaper, announced that green jobs would be the center of attention among jobs in the post-pandemic era. It projected that companies would become even more eco-friendly and around 1 million jobs can be created in the clean development area and low carbon sectors by 2050. Based on the forest potential to create jobs, the, forest, the Korean Forest Service uh, has expanded previous jobs concerning the people's safety, including forest disaster jobs, and we have also newly adopted digital-based jobs 
such as forest alert personnel in which ICT is combined with forest watchers jobs. And such jobs created in the forest sector will contribute to economic recovery and this will also ensure that forests will stay there for their citizens for recreational and other economic purposes. We're going through an industrialized industrialization and in the post pandemic era, we have to ensure that forests are well managed to benefit the future generation. We need to continue to offer a wealth of green spaces in cities and we also need to invest in creating a, a circular economy and a virtual cycle of forests. I hope that this plenary session will serve as a foundation to achieve carbon neutrality through, through green recovery and collect the international community's will to overcome the pandemic and the climate crisis around the world. And at the same time, forests for a healthier world and trees for co-prosperity and peace will take root around the world. Thank you for your attention. Minister, thank you very much. I know we're going to lose you now because you have another important engagement, but thank you very much for giving us that uh, assessment of where the Republic of Korea is when it comes to forestry management, when it comes to building back better and integrating you know, health, mental health. You're, you're so right. When you are in a very, very green environment, you feel different. You feel less stressed. The air is different. People are happier. And it's great to see that um, a country and indeed a city that I always consider to be fairly urban and full of concrete is now going to become a bit like Rwanda, so green and verdant and, uh, and, and splendid. And, and it's great to see that you are going to create all these jobs and that there is an integration be between health and the economy and the forests, which is great. So thank you very much for that, Minister. Now, we were due to have uh, another speaker, Dr. Myrna Cunningham, who is president of the Fund for the Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean, FILAC. Sadly, she will not be able to join us. So we're going to move on to our panelists. I'm going to ask our panelists actually to come up. I'm going to call them all now. So we have Dr. August Giustianto, who is Director General of Sustainable Forest, Forest Management at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry at Indonesia. Please come forward and take your seat. Because this is a panel, we're going to change things. We have Ms. Adrianda Lucia Santa, who is the Director at the Directorate of Forest Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services of Colombia. Please come forward and take a seat. <laughs> Ms. Gertrude Kabusimbi Kenyangi, who is Executive Director at Support for Women in Agriculture and Environment at SWAGEN. So, uh, Madam Gertrude from Uganda, please come forward. Take a seat. Thank you. And on the line, we're going to have Madam Betty Bonsu, same name as me, probably from the same part of Ghana, <laughs> but she will not be here, she'll be online. And she is an environmentalist. She is the project coordinator of Green Africa Youth Organization. That's your panel. And I'm going to ask questions of the panel. I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats for this part, okay? So let me move. to my seat, okay. So we have a panel now, and we're gonna spread the discussion out. Um, I'm going to go, let's have a look. Yes, I'm going to go to Adriana, Lucia, no, in fact, before that, actually. Let me go to a different uh, panelist first, okay. So, Dr. Agus Giustianto, you've worked for many years as a professional and government employee at the Ministry of Forestry of Indonesia, 
for a good 25 or so years. So um, a lot of experience. You're involved very actively with various fora on environment and forestry issues. But we want to know from you, first of all, what lessons you have learned from your time in Indonesia, where you have seen huge efforts in policy making to promote sustainable forest management through community-based forestry and smallholder forestry. And we want to hear specifically about positive outcomes in people's livelihoods, because we're talking about integrating all these sectors, food security, nutrition, and well-being. Doctor, please tell us. Thank you very much. Excellencies and uh, distinguished delegates. Yeah, uh, at the outset, I would like to express my highest appreciation for the invitation to share our thoughts in underlining uh, the importance of forest for healthier, prosperous, and peaceful world. Such fundamental changes uh, involve a series of consistent uh, corrective measures and are reflected in our uh, continuous improvement in the quality of forest cover and ecosystem, uh, pollution uh, control, watershed management, uh, biodiversity, and the addressing of the climate change. And then the ability of forest to support uh, human life, uh, produce goods and services, and to conserve uh, biodiversity and the balance of the ecosystem and uh, the natural uh, resources within Indonesia's landscape. Starting in the beginning uh, of uh, 2020, the early phase of the His Excellency President Joko Widodo, second term, in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, hit all aspects of life in Indonesia, including the forestry sector. It has embedded efforts and threatened to undermine much of what has been achieved in the, last, in the last couple of years, especially because of the national budget allocation for the forestry sector and the environment has been hugely uh, reduced to cope uh, with the escalating pandemic. Nevertheless, uh, the government is still confident that by priori prioritizing activities and maintaining uh, consistency with corrective measures, Indonesia can continue to progress towards sustainable forest management within a long-term vision of sustainable development. Uh, during the pandemic era, the government uh, of Indonesia supported forestry business operation by relaxing some uh, administrative procedures, delaying loan repayments, extending grace periods, optimizing uh, state budgets, and accelerating labor-intensive activities through social forestry program. Social forestry is a national priority program to sustainably manage forests for community welfare, including through agroforestry, which uh, where people uh, obtain income generation from forest products, agricultural uh, intercropping, and plantation. Within uh, more than 4 million hectares of social forestry licenses awarded so far, food is grown on about 300,000 of those hectares across the country's provinces. The government also introduced uh, an e-learning system, especially for smallholders engaged in social forestry, on how to adapt the forestry uh, practices and always comply with the COVID-19 prevention uh, protocols. Other measures undertaken during the COVID-19 pandemic include supporting wildlife in ex situ conservation areas to survive by providing sufficient food, facilitating the non-timber forest product market, implementing law enforcement through uh, restorative justice, and initiating a forest healing program in conservation areas. Up to now, the Minister of Environment and Forestry has continuously evaluated oil palm concession and their licenses and come up with um, more than 1 million hectares of forest test areas with in uh, the concession will be maintained as high conservation for forest. And the ministry has also consistently formulated, uh, executed, evaluated its policies and regulations based on moral and scientific grounds. Moral values are enshrined in the Article 33 of Indonesian Constitution, which states that land, waters, 
and natural resources shall be under the jurisdiction of the state and used for the greatest benefit of the people. Hence, the Constitution uh, provides governing procedure for natural resources and moral guidance. Policies are also developed based on evidence and science. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, but Dr. Justianto, can you, can you explain to me what were the challenges you faced in trying to implement this program, especially given the pressures of the pandemic to support people in forestry, to try and build back better, and to try and integrate the various sometimes competing issues that we've talked about today and previously at this Congress. I'm asking you a supplementary because you nicely finished ahead of your time, which yeah. I commend you for. <laughs> yes, to be able to continue with uh, corrective actions uh, to ensure more effective programs and a greater scale of intervention towards uh, sustainable development goals, an adequate financial support is needed. Yeah. Uh, mobilizing domestic resources and allocating them for prioritized program will ensure to the achievement of the strategic objective in managing uh, forest resources. Hence, strengthening international funding cooperation to fill national budget gaps is important. All in all, uh, Indonesia is ready to pursue sustainable forest management to not only provide uh, prosperity for all Indonesian citizens, but also to contribute the world by achieving sustainable development goals. Furthermore, by strengthening collaborative and also complementary actions amongst uh, the entire global community, Indonesia believes that the world will be able to build back better and will continue to achieve sustainable development goals. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, tremendous. You can applaud if you like. <laughs> I, I, I heard one person and then they stopped. Tremendous. Okay, so we're going to go from Indonesia to Colombia, right on the other side of the world. And we're going to hear from the Director of Forests, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services at the Ministry of Environment. She is Ms. Adriana Lucia Santa, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the cultural and spiritual benefits of forests and their connection to greater well-being. Well, bearing in mind recent history, the pressures on the government of Colombia and people who care about forests to make sure that the political tensions do not damage the ambitions for forestry management and all the other associated benefits that come with well-managed forests, especially when it comes to post-conflict arenas and peace building. So, Adriana Lucia Santa, over to you. Give us a picture from beautiful, wonderful Colombia. Thank you, Henry. Oh, yes. Okay. Bueno, eh, ante este hermoso panel quiero... We are here at this beautiful gathering. Thank you very much to the Korean government for this invitation. And thank you also to Deputy Director General Maria Helena Sabendo for this invitation. Thank you for inviting Colombia to the 15th World Forestry Congress. In January and February, every year, this is what happens in Colombia. We, we have about 27,000 tons of yellow dust that flies from the Sahara Desert into the Amazon region, including Colombia, Brazil, and Ecuador. And because of that, our forests are impacted in this way. So the sand, which includes nutrition within the sand, comes from Africa to the Amazon region. This is a part of nature. And so that is why we are so much connected as we see at the World Forestry Congress. Colombia is indeed a nation of forests. 
we actually have 60 million hectares of forest and we have many local communities living within the forests. The forest within Colombia symbolizes knowledge, peace, and insights. And the Afro-Colombian community also lives here. Our indigenous communities take up about 30,000 hectares as of 2007. Colombia had a great level of forestry destruction, but that was due to years of conflicts, as you're well aware, due to armed groups. We signed a peace treaty in 2007, and thanks to the peace treaty, we have been able to enjoy peace, not only in Colombia, but throughout the region. Ever since then, we have gathered to empower the local communities and the people. And that is when we started to give deep thought to forestry. 2.7 million hectares of forest in which indigenous groups live in we believe that these are the areas where we need to give more opportunities. The land should be utilized by the indigenous people and the Afro-Colombian communities. And we had this sentiment politically as well. The victims of armed groups such as farmers were also included in this community. And so what we need to do is strengthen governance within the local communities. And in that process, we also faced great challenges. In particular, related to restoring land and forests, we have had great difficulties we had a program called Amazon Vision with international participation. At that time, we did come up with a few strategic pillars. And the indigenous groups within the Amazon were included as one of the strategic pillars. So 20 million hectares surrounding the Amazon are in inhibited by indigenous groups, and 139 projects were conducted with the indigenous communities to include various projects related to the land inhibited by the indigenous communities. The indigenous communities are well aware of the land that they were living on, but utilizing modern technologies in cooperation with the Colombian government, we were able to survey the land and also accumulate more knowledge. We were also able to come up with more ways to utilize the forests. The indigenous communities and the Colombian communities, when they are living in the Amazon region, we need to take into consideration the institutions that have been established by the indigenous communities. So the indigenous communities became one of the pillars for decision making. And through our vision titled Amazon Vision, the indigenous communities were able to voice their opinions concerning the, la the land that they were living on. So the indigenous communities within the Amazon region were able to share their knowledge and best practices about agriculture and farming, as well as how to sustainably utilize the natural resources. We were also able to leverage their traditional knowledge to discuss how to utilize the natural resources. Not only culture, but economy was considered. And throughout that process, 
the indigenous communities actively participated. Ghana kucha and palm oil are just some of the products from the native plants that have been grown by the indigenous communities. And so creating value from such plants are very important. This was all possible th thanks to cooperation. Women and families are another important pillar. We need to take this pillar into consideration to create a healthier community. Amongst the communities within the Amazon, 18% of the resources are allocated to programs related to the empowerment of women. Women empowerment has been strengthened throughout this process. And so many families, especially 25,000 families benefited from these programs. And furthermore, there are also people living in this region who, for one reason or another, need to re relocate to other regions. And in such cases, we provided education and training so that they will be equipped with the knowledge and experience to take care of forests. Colombia possesses very important pieces of land. And Colombia is a country where illegal mining of minerals happens very frequently. The area called Port in Colombia is very important. FAO has helped us respond to these challenges and has supported us in teaching the local community on the utilization of non-wood resources. And we also connected these efforts with tourist tourism. There are about 600 families that have benefited from these projects. So we have closely collaborated with local communities and we also have programs such as restoration of ecosystems. 355 local communities participated. The destruction of forests happened heavily after the conflict, but even after time has gone by, many native trees have been destroyed and lost. And so we have planted an additional 120 million trees. And by coming up with a production program, we have been able to work in the Santa Marta mountain range. And the local community there, they were they were able to teach us what mother nature teaches them so we were able to find new opportunities by learning from the local communities and by doing so we were able to restore the forests and we were also able to share the opportunities together thank you very much <laughs> clap like you mean it very good thank you very much indeed um, Adriana, that was uh, uh, wonderful. You've taught me far more about Colombia in the last 10 minutes than I knew for the last 10 years. So that's uh, tremendous. So we've been to um, East Asia here, um, Korea. We've heard uh, the example from Korea. We've been to Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and we've been to Latin America, Colombia. Three different examples from around the world. We're going to go to Africa very shortly. Before we do, let me go to the de Deputy Director of FAO, Maria Elena Semido. I saw you taking copious notes and scribbling away furiously, and every so often you would go like you were agreeing with something. Now, I myself, although not an expert in forestry, I'm encouraged by what I've been hearing so far. If you consider what we're discussing here, forests for a healthy, prosperous, and peaceful world, 
But how encouraged are you by what you've heard so far? Thank you, and I think... Microphone, us, yeah. Thank you. I, I believe all of us, we are very encouraged for the examples we heard uh, from Korea, from Indonesia, from Colombia, because forest is not looked at only about trees, at the trees, the service it provides, and I think more and more after COVID-19, the importance of our well-being. Because maybe bef uh, before that, when we look at the indigenous community, the, the role forests have in terms of their spirituality, mm. the services offer. But now, all of us from all around the world, we could value this service. Yes. And I believe where we are confined, all of us looked for a, a, a green space where we can breathe, where we can stay with our family, and somehow, when possible, with our friends. This to see that I am very, I was like you, listening attentive what Colombia has done yes. and how also forests was used to rebuild peace. And this showing that uh, is the economic part, is the, the social part, is the spiritual part and the environment and the healthy part. So when I said the health is the physical and the mental health yes. and more and more we can value. Sometimes we don't put a value in terms of money but the value of forest, I think, is diversified. And let's protect, let's conserve our fa fa forest for a greener and healthy world. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Now, let's move to a country which I believe is extremely green. I've not been there myself, although I landed at Entebbe Airport once for an hour. But I, I have been to neighboring Rwanda, which is extremely green. But I'm told Uganda is so green, so verdant, so luscious, wonderful biosphere. And let us hear from a, a Ugandan forestry activist who has been working with the National Forest Authority to protect and promote the sustainable use of tropical forests in the country's districts of Mbara, Isingiro, Ntugamo, and West Bugwe forest area since 1994. She is Ms. Gertrude Kabusimbi Kenyangi. And um, Gertrude, you're going to share with us the experiences of local communities and forest-based enterprises in sustainable forest management, uh, representing, importantly, the voice of women and indigenous peoples and their strong connection with forests, food security, nutrition, health and well-being, exactly what we're talking about in this plenary. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Gertrude, and to hear what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I bring you greetings, the audience. I bring you greetings from the indigenous peoples and local communities that are forest dependent. And like the moderator has asked me to speak, and at in the context of forests for a healthier and prosperous world. From time immemorial, forests have been a key component of many rural livelihoods for both subsistence and commerce. Women tend to depend on forests for fruits, flowers, roots, and leaves for food and medicine, while men also depend on forests for game meat, wild honey, firewood, charcoal for cooking, and timber for sale, materials for agriculture implements, house construction, and, fence, and fencing, fodder for livestock, and grazing of livestock. In fact, I cannot ex exhaust the list of benefits that we, would, we used to derive from forests. Both men and women attach cultural and spiritual values to forests. In other words, forests are sacred. However, this came to an abrupt end with the first United Nations Sustainable Development Conference in Rio. Forests were gazetted. That means governments, our governments grabbed 
forests from indigenous peoples and local communities gentle care. Indigenous communities and local, indigenous peoples and local communities were denied access to the forest life support goods while legal and illegal timber harvesting escalated. Indigenous peoples and local communities became more hungry, unable to access food, and even more sick, unable to access medicine. This had the spin-off uh, spin effect of spilling violence into at household level. Gender-based violence became the order of the day when men could no longer provide for their families from the forests from which they used to derive sustain, sustain, I mean, livelihoods. With collapsed masculinities, there was a lot of gender-based violence, and uh, you know that world proportion uh, conflicts arise from conflicts at household level. Households being the building blocks of society. And I'm speaking from the perspective of indigenous people and local communities, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Forest governance became more undemocratic and more unjust. Indigenous peoples and local communities fought running battles with forest authorities in some instances. Now, that, that is neither healthy nor prosperous. Until forest government, governance becomes truly human rights based with participation of stakeholders and rights holders with accountability with non-discrimination. Until governments perform their duty and respect the rights of access to and control of and decision-making regarding forest resources by indigenous peoples and local communities. Until governments protect indigenous peoples and local communities from powerful corporations with their, choice, with their soil chains that they are using to harvest timber, many times illegally. When it's legal harvesting of timber, that is accountability. But when it becomes illegal, there's no accountability. Until governments fulfill their commitments to gender responsive empowerment of indigenous peoples and local communities to equitably share in forest benefits Forests will be for will not be for, will be a, for a healthier and prosperous few. It will not be for a healthier and prosperous world. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much indeed, Gertrude. That's a wonderful uh, call to action there. Before we go to Ghana, let me ask you a quick supplementary. Um, how much change have you seen in the attitude of the uh, government of Uganda during the time that you have been advocating in this way? Have you seen a shift and a more equitable approach to forestry management which respects the human rights of the people who live there, who are indigenous and who are so often marginalized and dismissed? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. There's a lot of discrepancy they, I've seen, I've, I've witnessed a shift on paper. Policies are fantastic. Laws are world class. But when it, it goes down, it percolates to practice. That's where the discrepancy is. That's where the double standards are. Mm. We don't know who to accuse. Whether it's the law enforcement agents or whether it's that we cannot accuse the governments because they have documents yes. to prove their commitment, but we would like more commitment to enforcing laws, more commitment to involving the indigenous peoples and local communities. When, for instance, interventions such as Red Plus are introduced into the community, we want to see free, prior, and informed consent that is real and practical. 
We don't want to see it on paper. We want people not socially, not uh, unfairly included, you know, required to put up uh, to a certain amount of money, for instance, to participate in meetings. We want the government to take up their duty to fulfill their commitment of gender responsive uh, involvement and participation of the, we don't want to call ourselves the weak. We don't want to call ourselves uh, the vulnerable. We call ourselves marginalized. Yeah. Because the for forests initially belong to indigenous peoples and local communities. And then when laws that were introduced through colonialism uh, took away the land from being customary or, or from having customary ownership tenure, it became very difficult for indigenous peoples to, uh, to secure their tenure rights. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Gertrude, uh, for that perspective from Uganda. And now let's go to Ghana, a country I know very well, and um, talk to a young activist who shares the same middle name and surname as me. We could be related several um, cousins removed. She is Miss Betty Osei-Bonsu. I'm Henry Osei-Bonsu. Yes, you can think what you like. Betty is smiling there and a wonderful green background. Excellent, Betty. So by way of introduction, so Betty is the project coordinator at Green Africa Youth Organization, GEO, and um, it champions the sustainable community project in Ghana. And she's going to share with us her perspective and vision on the relationship between human beings and forest ecosystems and the connections with well-being and hear how youth can play a bigger role in reshaping people's behavior to provide solutions to pressing environmental issues through youth empowerment, skills development, and public education. Betty, we are waiting with great anticipation to hear what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you very much. I love the introduction. <laughs> of course. And I also want to use the opportunity to say that Greetings from all the youth from Ghana, and thank you so much for the platform. I also want this opportunity to acknowledge all protocols. Let me start with a story. When I was young, being allowed to play was seen as a reward, and farming-related activities like weeding and digging were more of a punishment and a survival option for many of us. Psychologically, this makes agriculture and anything associated with it less appealing. As I introduced, my name is Betty, and I'll be speaking on youth perspective and vision on the relationship between humans, the forest, and the connection with well-being. Next slide, please. <laughs> Securing the future of our forest in this growing continent with the fast-paced development is not an easy task. Therefore, it would require a conscious effort to change our mentality and belief whilst creating a balanced ecosystem. According to an article published in the Oxford Academic Journal, if respect for ecosystem is not yet a widely held core value, then additional policy relevant information may work first to change the secondary belief about relationship on ecosystem and human health. So secondary belief, it meant we had a first belief. So if you ask me, what are your perspectives on the relationship? And I'll tell you. Next slide. The relationship has always been a one-sided affair with man heavily dependent on nature and the ecosystem. And when any human decides to give back to the environment, it's seen as punishment or payback, like the polluter spray principle. Oh, you can go ahead and pollute. Just be sure to pay back when you are done. The forest ecosystem has served us for a long time, stemming from the water we drink, to the air we breathe, the medicine we take to our day-to-day -day living. But the question remains, how long can the forest continue to do so when we don't give back to it or even give it a break? We really have to pull that emergency break. But this question, surprisingly, is for me and my unborn children to tell the tale. Will there be sustainability for us in the coming years? 
Next slide. When I was in the University of Cape Coast, Ghana, doing my undergraduate, I witnessed the uncontrollable depletion of our trees for firewood, charcoal, using cooking. Not only was this posing threat to the forest ecosystem I could see, but also to the health of our mothers. Therefore, I decided to propose a solution that included using a low-cost instrument built from local resources to produce charcoal brickwork from palm kernel shells. Palm kernel shells, most of you know, is usually waste discarded after cooking. This also contributes to renewable energy in Ghana, which would eventually lead to solving our existing energy crisis. Additionally, reducing climate change impacts via the reduction of the over-dependency on fair wood and charcoal for domestic and commercial heating. This was published in the Helion Elsevier and was the first article in Ghana that saw the conversion of palm kernels to energy. What point am I trying to make? Gone are the days where you hold placards and demand for action or complain of problems. Now, we are making the action and creating the solutions, especially leveraging on local and indigenous solutions. Next slide. Following this, I joined the Green Africa Youth Organization, a youth-led gender-balanced advocacy organization focused on environmental sustainability and community development. This is where we founded the initiative called Trees for Biodiversity and have been able to, in Ghana, plant over 10,500 trees and monitor them adequately with the community members to restore biodiversity and very importantly, introduce back into the urban system indigenous trees. These pictures you can see from several of the activities we've embarked on our trees for biodiversity activities and also our youth clubs within universities. Next slide. Also, this particular organization, I am coordinating a sustainable community project that also leverages on waste to resources like the production of fertilizers and compost, which serves as substrate for tree seedlings, supporting farmers to produce organic crops. This is creating alternative jobs for many of the community individuals whilst diverting waste from landfills. And this is what youth are doing in their communities. These and many more actions are being carried out by youth in their communities. But it's not enough. More can be done. We need these efforts to be scaled and replicated. We need more youth on board. But how can we make this happen? What do we need as youth? Next slide. To begin with, youth leadership, capacity development trainings, fundings, opportunities for fundings, resources to expand our knowledge gap, access to information <laughs> in my part of the world, not speaking up and demanding for answers, are seen as respect, but it's time for us to change that narrative. Lastly, the platform. Many youth have been able to groom themselves, develop themselves, but they lack the platform to highlight their works. That's, I'm really grateful for this platform. And luckily in Ghana, through the efforts of GAIO, Green Africa Youth Organization, and other organizations, we've been able to implement the Youth Climate Council in Ghana that has implemented or is serving as a platform for a unified climate youth movement amplify youth climate voices and create opportunities for young climate activists in Ghana. This kind of platform are existing. We need a government to recognize them as existing bodies and also and engage them and make sure they are included. Next slide. In conclusion, what are youth's vision on the relationship between humans forest ecosystems and the connection with well-being. Before I conclude, youth are the forefront in, rec in recognizing the relationship between the environment and human rights. According to the 2018 report by UN Special Reporter on Human Rights and Environment, more than 1.5 million children under the age of five lose their life each year as a result of avoidable environmental impacts we would be the ones to feel the burnt of all this problem if urgent actions are not taken. So if you ask me our vision, me being a youth and representing the youth voices, we envision the prioritization of the environment over profits and business as usual. 
the restoration of our ecosystem over importation and exploitation, and social justice and inclusion over social injustice and exclusion. As you, we want nothing more than a green, resilient, healthy, and sustainable future. Thank you very much. Give Betty a round of applause, please. That was uh, very passionate, very focused, detailed, with real examples. Betty, thank you very much. Can we get Betty back up, please? I want to see her face again, because I've got to ask you, there you are. I need to ask you a supplementary before we go to further questions. Uh, Betty, you went through a range of things that you said the youth need to catalyze and scale up what they've been doing. And that was really helpful to have those four suggestions. And I'm wondering what the response has been to your activism. I mean, you're not just holding placards anymore, you said. You're doing real world action. You're showing what can be done using organic substances, which is great. But what has the response been of the Ghana Forestry Service and other agencies to you? Have they welcomed you and said, please, we want to assist you, uh, we want to do more? Or do they see you as a young irritant? How do they respond to you? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bunsu. This is a very important question because surprisingly, although for a period of time, it hasn't been so welcoming, but recently we've been receiving a lot of, should I say welcome from them. I recall I once from the beginning of the year when I started a new project with one assembly, it wouldn't, it would surprise you that for three months period, I used three months to bridge that boundary of me being a female, me being a young person, just to get the closure with the head of the assembly. And luckily, all you have to do as a youth is to show that you are capable before they give you the platform. And I don't think that should be so. We should be able to get the platform even before we start proving our worth. And so, yes, previously we were not given the platform, we're not given the opportunities, but now we are getting the glimpse of the light. You are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And majority of that, like this platform, we are seeing that. And luckily we are getting the exposure from the government and commending our works and also including us when it comes to platforms and policies. Betty, for the moment, thank you very much indeed um tremendous to hear what's happening on the ground there in ghana and before we go to questions and you're encouraged to think of a question or response to what you've heard do we have any microphones around i'm just looking are there microphone i don't see any microphone stands but hopefully people will be able to do we have some yes i think we do yes okay good um but maria elena i i, I want to get your a quick response uh, from you to what Betty said and to what Gertrude said because two very different pictures so the young activist who is walking the walk and talking the talk and people are responding finally and then we also have a more difficult picture from Uganda where um, it's not necessarily the kind of response we would get great laws but implementation problems it would appear. Your, your, your thoughts quickly on both those examples. Uh, thank you and thank you, Beth. What Beth, while she was speaking, you know, uh, I live five years in Ghana. Ah. And uh, I was so pleased to listen to you because one of the, the, the things I, const I could see when I was in Ghana, the need to create this kind of movements. You could see that in the beaches, um, everything was thrown away in the beaches. Uh, the, the, the care for the environment, for the forest was not there. Uh, and it was something always shocked me. Uh, but I am so happy to listen that uh, you are creating this movement because I think it's not only the youth. You need to go beyond the youth, but also the old generation to create this consciousness, uh, consciousness of the need to protect uh, and the environment in order to have what you said, a green, resilient, healthy and sustainable future, not only for you, but for all of us. 
and I'm happy also that the government is supporting you and I could I think you need to go beyond the government but to bring all the United Nations there all the other NGOs create extend this platform that that you have uh, this to say that I am really pleased to see the dynamics around and how the, the youth have a voice and a place in this area. Okay, now for Uganda. Now for Uganda. I think it's, this is happening, uh, particularly with the indigenous people I, I referred before. Uh, it's a question of human rights and more and more I think we are going there. But it's, it's true that the legislation is, is there, but uh, we need to support and to push the government uh, to implement the legislation. But it's not only the role of the government. I think the civil society, mm -hmm. the indigenous people, they have to recall the government that they, they have rights and the rights have needs to be secured. Mm -hmm. And this is a society issue, yes. uh, if I can say. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Maria Elena. Okay, so it's now time to throw things open. And I'm just looking to see if I have a question or two from the people who've been listening and who want to ask our panelists uh, something or who want to make a brief statement um, reflecting their own position, what they've heard, what they think needs to be done. Just raise your hand. Don't be shy, don't be scared, we won't bite you. Everything is fine. Because I, I myself am inspired by what I've been hearing, even though there are challenges. And I'm sure uh, you also feel as though you want to respond. Um, do we have the microphones? Is it clear where you have to go? Yes, okay. So the microphone is there. Okay, do we have somebody who wants to? Yes, okay, please. Can you come to the microphone? It's quite a way you have to pretend to be Eliud Kipchoge. Just run. If you don't know who Kipchoge is, he's the world record holder in the marathon and he's from Kenya. And he lives in a place called Iten, I think, high up in the hills, a very green place. Okay, tell us who you are, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Lamus Priyadi. I'm from Yangnam University. So actually, I'm a student. But actually, I'm from Indonesia. From Indonesia, yes? Yes. Uh, and my question is. Uh, the biggest environment problem often come from the big countries because uh, their industries uh, produce a lot of pollution. I'm not hearing you very clearly. Can you just okay. speak? Don't go, don't go too close to the microphone. Just yeah. Okay, yeah, come. Uh, the biggest environment problem often come from the big countries yes. because their industry uh, produce a lot of pollution. Apart from algae in the sea, the world needs forests to clean the air. So the forest must be protected, uh, protected properly. But uh, unfortunately, the forests are in developing countries. Sorry, are in developing countries. Uh, developing countries that have fight and uh, do hard work to protect their forests. While the problem often come from the big countries or developed countries. In your opinion, how should the world work together to protect forests? So. Uh, that all are treated fairly. I think it's not fair because uh, some problem or often problem come from the big country. Yes, yes. But the solution have to come from the yes in developing country. Like Thank India, you very Indonesia. much for that. I think okay. I get your point. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you, our much. friend from Indonesia. So I'm just looking to see who would like to respond to that. How about you, Adriana? Uh, so think about what our friend from Indonesia said: the great forests are mainly in developing countries, in the two-thirds world, but the great polluters tend to be in the global north. But they expect the work to be done by the people who have not caused most of the problems. So how do you see us resolving this somehow? This is not easy, you know? What do you think? I'm asking you to be um, <laughs> a great diplomat here. Okay. Eh, bueno, yo creo que esto es un propósito colectivo. Yes. Concerning this issue, well, I don't think 
we can find solutions solely from developing countries. Advanced countries and developing countries must work together to find solutions. And that's where the difficulty lies. For Colombia, we emit only 0.4% of the global carbon emissions. But concerning the climate crisis, we are quite vulnerable. And so related to this, Colombia has revised our laws so that financially we will be able to provide funding for forest restoration. This is actually including all aspects, including cultural aspects, and we need international cooperation on all fronts. This is something that we are well aware of. And we also need to continue sustainable management of forests, and we cannot simply wait for funding. Uh, we need to respond immediately. And this is not something that only developing countries should be doing, but we need advanced countries to provide the funding. And developing countries need to strengthen their governance and sovereignty. Yes, so, I mean, Adriana basically saying, you give us the funding, but also we have to strengthen our regulations because for a long time, very large companies from um, OECD countries have gone into developing world countries where the rich natural resources are and done whatever they like by just bribing people and even persuading governments to change the laws. Um, so the question is, what should the relationship be? Um, how can it be mutually beneficial? Um, who else wants to take this question? I'm just looking at you, Agurus, um, Gertrude, no, 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 not that. Betty, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, as a young firebrand in Ghana, do you have thoughts on this? Because for a long time, I mean, I know this in the West African scene, governments were accused of being very, very laissez-faire. Uh, so long as some money was coming into the country from large corporations, it didn't matter what happened to the forests. That's changing now. But what do you want to see in response to our Indonesian friend's question? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I think um, one thing I would want to see is the open access to information. Mm -hmm. I think that is one thing that is lacking so much. If we are able to do that, then we are creating that enabling environment for awareness and policy implementation. Because right now, when it comes to accessing information, it's not sufficient. Whatever is available, the data are lacking. We don't have the necessary data in hand to even implement solutions, how we want to do that. So, if we get the access to information, then our full potential for implementing locally based solutions for, for our forest can, can be achieved. That's all I'll have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Let's get another question. Do we have another question? Because we've got a bit of time now. Yes, we have somebody there. Okay, let's get Hello, somebody there to the is a, a question in the chat because the event is hybrid, so there are also people connected. And the question is coming from Indi Akurugoda, and it is addressed to Mr. Agus Giustianto. Yes. It is, does palm oil industry bring a threat to rainforests? Are there policies in place to address this? Thank you. Could you repeat that question? Sure. Repeat the question, please. Does palm oil industry yes. bring a threat to rainforests? Okay. Very Are good. there policies in place to address this? Thank you very much indeed, Agus. So from an Indonesian perspective, 
a question there about the palm oil industry and being a threat to the rainforest, to the forests, and what do you do about it? What policies do you have in place to mitigate or to deal with this? Yes, <laughs> thank you for the questions. Yeah, actually, uh, we understand that uh, palm oil uh, have uh, great contribution for the uh, national income. But now, uh, due to the uh, environmental problem, we actually uh, have some uh, corrective measure or policies. For example, uh, there is a moratorium to uh, give the permit for the palm oil. So there is no uh, extensification for the palm oil. We encourage to uh, the palm oil companies to get more productive and also intensification of, of their land. And we do hope that we can uh, optimize our uh, palm oil uh, production through uh, the existing uh, land areas, not more to uh, enlarge the, the palm oil areas through the uh, forest areas. So uh, I think uh, we have to realize that palm oil is also important for our uh, nation. Thank you. Can, can you explain why you impose the moratorium on permits? Was it as a result of data? Was it as a result of activism and lobbying? Was it external pressure? Because granting permits can be very lucrative. It can give you short-term money. So why the change in policy? Yes, because <clears throat> we are facing um, uh, problems here. Yeah. For example, uh, there is an encroachment from uh, local community to the forest area. So we uh, now uh, strict to not allow uh, the palm oil plantation in the forest areas. Mm -hmm. So it means that they have to uh, uh, intensify the, the palm oil uh, areas outside the forest areas. Right. Well, this means the orang utan is safe. Yes, of course. Well, I love the <laughs> orang utan. Okay, let's get another question. Um, is somebody there? So can we get a microphone? Or is there a microphone nearby or? Is this thing on? Oh, it is. <laughs> Hello, my name is Loker Kessler. I'm from the United States of America. Hello. Uh, I would first like to say, Betty, I love your hat. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say that, but continue. Uh, my question is that there's these conversations about needing to connect people with smaller voices with people with bigger voices. Uh, the uh, green Africa and the indigenous people of Uganda have a lot smaller voices than FAO and Korea. So what efforts are being made by larger voices to reach out to smaller groups and what can smaller groups do to stand out of the crowd and reach the larger voices? Okay, larger voices assisting smaller voices and vice versa. Thank you, Volker, did you say your name is? Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, I'm just wondering, Gertrude, would you like to um, talk about that a little bit before we see if any of the other panelists want to respond? Because you're working with groups of people whose voices might be deemed small and they're trying to shout up to larger organizations, whether it be forestry uh, ministries or indeed to FAO or other organizations to help them get their rights and get justice. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And the person who asked the question, thank you very much for bringing that up. Smaller voices, what you called smaller voices, are actually not very small. When we mobilize and organize and uh, speak together, speak as one voice, we are actually loud. But we are betrayed by those who, when we have, we have spoken up, 
the people who are supposed to protect us, the people who are supposed, who have put in place like global policies, will not even consider when they approach our countries, they will not even consider to negotiate with us, uh, to negotiate with our governments when we are present. They will prefer to negotiate behind our backs. That's when you say that their voices are louder than ours. But you know, it's just betrayal. It's not that, uh, so what we want them to do, the big voices, we don't want them to give us money, although money is very important. Well, we want them to be moral. It's a moral issue. It's when uh, people put yeah, profit over people and the planet, then it becomes a moral issue. So for instance, the gentleman that was talking about palm oil, uh, the, uh, palm oil the proponents of palm oil are corporations, very powerful corporations. When they come to acquire land, they will not, when, when they are scouting for land, for land, they will not ask the local people, they will ask the government. Yeah. And before you know it, the government is rounding up the uh, local people and throwing them out. So it's a moral issue, it's more of a mor moral issue than, you know, uh, an issue, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I need to ask uh, Adriana, about that actually because the example you gave us from Colombia was very different. The gentleman's question was about small voices trying to influence big voices and sometimes really struggling. But according to what you told us, there is a mutual respect in Colombia. You're talking to indigenous people. Nobody can just come in and parachute over the heads of indigenous people and just go to government or a rich landowner and bypass them. Can you explain how that came about? How this positive relationship that you're describing, which our friend wants to see more of, came about? The people who were seen as small voices, talking to the bigger voices, but working together mutually for a green, healthy and resilient future. Gracias, Henry. Well, in Colombia, we have seen positive cooperative relations, but at the same time, it took a very long time to establish such relations. We had to work with the local communities and the indigenous groups. We had to bring all of their practices into a single legal system, which was very difficult to do. I don't think any perfect processes exist. And it takes a very long time to achieve optimal results. In Colombia, related to the restoration and management of forests, we had to invest a lot of time. And during that time, what we came to understand is that the governance of each community depends on local participation. And we believe that such local participation is what makes local communities successful. And with that realization, we were able to achieve the current results. We need to remember that there are always differences in opinions and perspectives, but in overcoming these differences, we need to make sure that national regulations play the role of mediation and in order to have that mediation role, we need to have a good understanding of the local communities and we must reflect the voices of everyone. Related to bio charcoal projects, we have had such examples. And in that process, dialogue was the most important for that project. And 
Against the backdrop of our experience, we believe that dialogue is key to success. For that, Adriana. Um, let me go back to Betty because I think you must have something to say about this if you heard the question from our friend from the United States there. Um, how have you managed to amplify what might be described as a little voice or a small voice to the point where people are listening to you at a local, maybe, and regional or even national level? What has been the secret of your success so far to, in order to, for you to be taken more seriously? Okay, thank you very much. With respect to your question, we as an organization, or I myself as an, uh, a youth, we've been able to put more passion into the work we do to amplify our voice and amplify the works that we do. And apart from that, too, we've been able to connect with the relevant bodies, prove ourselves to them that we are capable of executing projects and also carrying that youth mandate. But also wanting to touch on the question of um, the, the question they asked about uh, the, the project within communities and how community individuals or the higher can relate to the lower and the lower can also relate to the, the higher. I, I would also want to propose that we should have community consultations with projects. Projects should feature in community consultations where we have the community proposing what they want to be done what project they want to be established and not just organizations coming down to the ground and implementing projects from anywhere. Apart from that, the monitoring and evaluation criteria of projects should factor in individual proponents, like individual voices within the communities. So this I, I will be able to propose with respect to that interchange. Thank you. Thank you very much. Volker, did you have a response to any of that? Uh, no response, then thank you for the answers. Tremendous, thank you for the question. I believe we have another question coming through. Is that from the chat? Loretta, is that right? Yes, yes there is. Um, it is a college student who is here in Korea, uh, a student studying uh, forestry. And he would like to ask to the representatives of Indonesia and Uganda that um, he heard that you emphasize forest governance. In order to establish forest-related governance, I think it's important to establish a communication channel for local residents to participate. I wonder if there is such a communication channel in your countries. And if there is, I would like to know what format is. Thank okay, you. thank Steer. you very much for that, Loret. Okay, so, um, Agus, in Indonesia, what kind of communication channel is there that people can use in order to establish a good, healthy, respectful dialogue? That's what our student wants to know. Do you have one there? I'm sure you do. Yeah. Actually, in the setting up the regulation, we also uh, involve the stakeholders uh, in the consulta uh, public consultation. So I think uh, all uh, regulation is prepared that involve uh, other stakeholders. So I think through the multi-stakeholder process, uh, we can also learn and also get uh, input from the, the, the community, for example, uh, NGO, and, and so on. So through the uh, multi circle forces in Indonesia, uh, the regulation uh, can be uh, regulated. Thank Is this an official body, a committee, which has, um, say, three places for government members, uh, three for maybe unions, two for corporates? So how does it work? And, and do they meet regularly? Yes, of course. Uh, we have a uh, uh, mechanism on that. Uh, yes. I think uh, we involve all stakeholders in the process. Yeah, very good. Uh, and, and, and Gertrude, what happens in, in, in Uganda in the area that you are um, involved in? What kind of dialogue, what kind of forum in order to make sure people are heard and ideas are swapped? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, the forum that exists is through civil society organizations, but also there's a government 
government has established a structure for people to be able to give their input, especially now. The, policy, the forest policy is under review. So there's a structure. At the grassroots, there's a, 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 there's a, there are committees in very mi micro committees, I should call them. And those committees have quotas for women participation, for youth participation, for all that would call stakeholders participation. And then these feed into bigger committees until they reach the national level. From LC ones, we call them local council ones, up to the national government. But the, the, the communication becomes faulty. For instance, there's breakdown in communication when what the, the input from the grassroots is not reflected in decision making when, when, it, when the rubber hits the road. Uh, so um, what is the blockage? Who is doing the blocking? Well, translation of these, uh, of the inputs into real text, when you are putting together the policy, when we are putting together the laws, it's technocrats yeah. that are doing it. So when that happens, it becomes, that's where it evaporates. Uh. Yes. Uh, Agus um, yes. has some ideas here, go on. Yes, may I, have, I would like to add some additional information. Actually, we have a uh, forum, we call it the uh, National Forestry Council. Yes. So this forum consists of a representative from all stakeholders. Right. So I think through that forum, they can give an input from uh, uh, the stakeholders through uh, the process of uh, regulation setup. Very good, thank you for that. Um, do we have another question in the audience? Yes, please go to the microphone. Is that, do we have two people? Okay, form a queue. You can form a queue. <laughs> then one can follow the other. Tell us who you are. I am from the Republic of Korea. I am a teenager. I am living in the Republic of Korea. I am Song Min Jae. I am a youth. Thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to Betty. Recently in Korea, those in their 20s and 30s are be more and more interested in the environment. For example, we have flogging, which is picking up trash as we jog, or we also have challenges to have zero waste in our lives. So. Although we ha are very active, it, we never really re seem to receive a lot of attention when we voice our opinions. Betty, as you are a youth activist, have you had any experiences of not having your opinions respected because you are young? And if you have had those experiences, how do, how do you respond to that? And how do you become motivated to become so passionate? Betty is keen to answer okay. but not yet Betty let's get a second question um, because there was somebody else lining up so we'll take them in a cluster so let's have the second question please hello 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, mine is not an easy question to answer in a densely populated uh, high biodiversity uh, or rich biodiversity countries such as Sri Lanka, the values of farmers are never respected when forest policy is uh, dealt with. Today, we have lost so much forest cover that animals have no habitat, and their habitat are farmers' land holdings. Farmers are losing 40 to 50% of their crops. So like the youth, is there, is, is there a global movement to involve farmers in forest conservation or forest policy? Thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, so we'll go to Betty first of all, um, because Son Min Yoy uh, <laughs> picks up trash as she's jogging. Did she call it vlogging or something? <laughs> but she's not receiving the attention she feels she deserves. So Betty, you're her Ghanaian sister. Can you help? Give her some advice. She's being ignored. 
Okay, thank you very much. I can just uh, imagine what she's going through because I've also been there before. I've been in that shoe where you walk into an office and you tell them, I am this, I am asking for this, and they just decide to ignore you. Our voice became more heard when we became formal, we became a formal organization and we presented what we wanted to the assembly. So here our model is to reach out to the local assembly and then speak to them and tell them that we want to embark on this project or this is a particular thing we've identified in the community that is not working. We feel we can work collaboratively with your outfit to fix this problem. And the first question I'll ask you is, do you have the funds? So what do we do? We, go, we went back and started looking for proposals and projects and start applying for them. So frankly speaking, this is what we did. Reaching out and putting together proposals, calling for more collaborative stakeholders engagement, and then going back to the assembly and saying, we have the funds now, partner with us and let us create a solution we want to see. And yes, with respect to the circular economy project and the waste to energy, we are doing a lot of this within our communities now. And that is when we as a youth, we showed up at the forefront for our assembly saying, we have the finance, support us. With this, we sign a memorandum of understanding and we are reaching out to communities within schools. We are creating echo clubs where we are providing you the platforms to speak and their voices, creating that channel to the assembly. Also the Youth Climate Council I mentioned, where youth or youth led organizations now have the access to government. So this is what we are doing. And I hope maybe in your area, you could also stand on this particular model and, and do something. Uh, I think there's a, another follow up. Uh, yeah, that was about farmers okay, from our Sri Lankan okay, friend. Um, but before we address that one, quick follow up with you, Betty. I presume also it's very important to have a strong social media presence. Thank you. Yes, very, very true. As a youth, you need that strong social media presence. And I'm sure that is one of the things that has alleviated me to where I am today. Your LinkedIn profile should be top notch. Yeah. You have to present yourself marketable and being able to deliver. And that is how I am here today. So get those presents and don't name yourself on social media as Flexi lady or Flexi, <laughs> be yourself. Betty Osei would say my name. And every social media account you go, you find me there. So thank you, Bonsu. <laughs> thank you, Bonsu, fellow Bonsu, not Flexi lady. Okay, um, the question of Sri Lanka, from our Sri Lankan friend, saying the values of farmers are never really respected. Um, there's loss of um, farming territory, loss of habitat for the animals, crops are being lost, there's encroachment. So what about that? So, hmm, I'm just wondering who could answer that because our colleague, uh, the Deputy Director General of FAO, Maria Elena Semedo had to go. She may have been able to answer that one from FAO's perspective. But Adrian, I'm just wondering, um, the, you're looking at me thinking, what is he gonna ask? I'm wondering about farmers in Colombia, is there the similar issue whereby they were initially being marginalized, ignored, they were losing territory. There is of course deforestation and encroachment with wildlife and their views are not being respected. What is the case in Colombia vis-a-vis -vis the farmers? Bueno. Okay, before I answer this question, the message and advice from Betty was really wonderful. I want to add a little bit to that. In Colombia, we have a movement called the Youth for the Environment. It is a network of more than 5,000 students and they are conducting research on education and training, and they also offer education. I believe creating such a network will be effective. Now, moving on to responding to a question from a participant from Sri Lanka. In Colombia, we have a network for conservation. And this network 
consists of people from various sectors so that we can conserve our forests and lands collectively. This network started as a small-scale network, but it has become a nationwide network. And their actions were taken as policies. And these policies and network activities not only cover farmers, but also livestock industries and other stakeholders. Under those, under one principle of no forest, de, no deforestation, this network is working to promote interests of farmers and foresters at the same time. This is a mechanism that we have been working on to create in Colombia. It is because when you think about these wild lives, wild animals that are coming to destroy crops, these wild animals are not enemies to farmers. We first need to remember that humans have destroyed their habitats. So we need to create a mechanism where farmers and wild animals can coexist. We can create corridors for these wild animals so that we can protect crops and protect wild animals at the same time. I mentioned about an example of the Bio Cacao project. This is one such example. And also by utilizing agroforestry, we have been creating biological corridors for wild animals so that these can coexist with farmers. I believe that we also need the support of technology. In other words, we can provide technical and technological support to farmers and animal farmers. Uh, well, well, well answered. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Gertrude, do farmers um, factor in your uh, activism? I mean, do farmers uh, play a role? Is their voice heard? Yes, very much. Because the indigenous communities may have dwelt in the forests all their lives and they were hunter-gatherers, but the local communities are farmers. So they do factor very strongly in our activism and uh, when we are mobilizing, when we are organizing, it's them that are really organizing and mobilizing, including, of course, the indigenous peoples who are trying to adopt farming skills, but without much success. And uh, the farmers themselves have formed groups, have formed, you know, farming uh, associations. And more recently, as, as recently as 2014, when there was recognition for International Year of Family Farming, that one gave them a platform to bring their issues to the world stage. So the progression is very slow, but it's there. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Just enough time for one question, possibly? No, I think we're done. <laughs> There's one hand there. <laughs> Okay, quickly. <laughs> Gerard, I thought there was no more questions. <laughs> Very quickly, yes. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm Deborah. I'm Nigerian. And from Nigeria, yes. yes Nigeria. Come closer to the mic so we can hear. Sorry. Um, so my question is based on what um, Ms. Gertrude said. <coughs> Um, laws are indeed in existence. You find that in most of Africa, there are indeed laws, but as she said, there is no progression. So my question is, what can be done, like in a place where there, there are laws, but we are not seeing any movement? What are your recommendations? Like Ms. Gertrude said, that's my question. Thank you, that's the final question. And that will enable us to give some closing thoughts. Okay, so where there are laws, but there is no implementation. Our friend, our sister from Nigeria, wants to know. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, Gertrude. Back to you. And we'll do this one briefly. Where there are laws, but poor implementation. That is exactly the situation you find your people in, or the people that you're representing. So what is the next step? 
Well, short of violent protests, <laughs> short of resorting to violent protests, would recommend that you know we take it at the governance level. That is the national governance level. We sensitize, we appeal to the people, we get involved in politics so that you know we are trying to promote our people to get involved in politics who we are very sure that they are going to implement our laws. We, are, we have managed to put a few people in parliament who when we have, we need to, you know, like pass a, a, a certain law, we can, we know who to, to approach. So if you are not political, politically active, you are going to speak, cry yourself hoarse, and your things will not get on the agenda. Very good. Thank Betty, thank you very much. Briefly, Adriana, um, so if there is legislation and laws, but no implementation, what to do? Bueno, constantemente corresponde. Well, I continue to mention that we need to go through social economic committees so that we can continue to review relevant laws and legislations. We always need timely legislation that is appropriate for the times. So we need to make sure that we have timely laws and policies, and we have to continue to support that. Because at times, we have laws for law's sake. And so what we need to do is to make sure that legislation goes hand in hand with our reality. So as time goes by, we also need to monitor and assess the impact of laws and regulations. In the case of the Colombian government, we have set very ambitious goals for 2030. And socioeconomically, we have we are in the position to put in place relevant laws. And so we will need climate action and stabilization of the nation by 2030. And to achieve these ambitious goals, we will need new laws and regulations along with the financial regulations. Betty, I say bonsu, Betty. So laws are there, so-called regulatory environment is there, but people on the ground are not seeing it. They're not seeing the benefits of this. What should they do next? No violent protests. We're not recommending that, <laughs> Gertrude. <laughs> so, Hello, Betty, what's that, the, uh, Be Betty, the question, final question to you very briefly. So okay. laws are fine, but if they're not being implemented, what should activists, what should groups do? Very simple. We should start creating the solutions by ourselves to show that those solutions can happen. Thank you. Thank you very much to Betty Osei Bonsu, to Gertrude Kabusimbi Kinyangi, to Adriana Lucia Santa, Dr. Agus Justantio, who's gone, and Maria Elena Semedo. Um, the Deputy Director General of FAO and Minister Byongam Choi. That was a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. And I hope we've given you a fairly decent um, digest into this subject, building a green, healthy and resilient future with forests. Hopefully, you'll take some of these thoughts away into your next session and beyond. But for this plenary, I can now call it a close. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.